everybody, and welcome to Agribition. Uh, my name is Leah. I work with agriculture in the classroom, and I have the pleasure of being here with Courtney today. So Courtney is going to talk to us all about sheep, and I will let you introduce yourself, Courtney. Hey, kiddos. So my name is Courtney McDougall. I am a director with Canadian Western Agribition. I'm also the vice president of the Saskatchewan Sheep Breeders Association currently, and then a livestock exhibitors of sheep. Um, along with my kiddos, we have my kids sheep. So um, on our farm, uh, we farm with our grandpa and grandma. And so uh, we have two farms there. So there's Kim Dane sheep and then my kids. On our farm, we have a couple different sheep breeds, uh, the Suffolk, Hampshire, Southdown, North Country, Cheviot, and then um, a couple different uh, Lesters, Romanoffs, uh, Stragglers, and then a big commercial flock. So today we're here to talk about sheep. Yeah. Um, to start off at Agribition right now, we have over a hundred head of sheep um, and different breeds of all kinds. So uh, a couple of the breeds here today, we have Suffolks, um, Southdowns, Baby Doll Southdowns, uh, Canadian Arcots, North Country Cheviots, Hampshires, Texels, Charlays, uh, Rideau Arcot, um, I think I said Dorsets, oh there's some Blue Lesters, and I think I've caught in all of them, and then a big extension of a commercial flock, and those can be uh, ones that are crossbred, so they'll have a couple different breeds in them. As well, the difference between a purebred and a commercial, purebreds have papers, so their parents are all registered and their lineage is all detailed on a piece of paper. That's the difference between a purebred and commercial in our um, area of livestock. Okay, awesome. So Courtney, um, we are going to take questions from our classes. They're just gonna come up on the chat. So classes, if you can please type your questions into the chat. I'm gonna zip over to the computer and we'll get started. Great. Okay, so if, you, if your class has any questions for Courtney, please go ahead and ask them. Um, Courtney, off the bat, how many sheep do you have on your farm? So um, with the current situation in Saskatchewan where we reside, we're in between Regina and Lumsden, my parents' farm. And so our area is pretty dry. Um, we've been pretty drought stricken the last couple of years. So we did run a little bit of a larger flock, re but have recently come back. And at this point we're running 60 purebred ewes. And then um, we usually have a pen of animals that we run through the arbitoir for uh, meat purposes. And so at any time that, that pen can ha range from 20 to 40 animals. So usually with all the rams and the purebreds and commercials, we're probably around 100 um, sheep on our farm. Okay, awesome. So we have a question from Memphis in grade three. Can sheep be different colors? Yes, Memphis, that's a great question. So there's um, a lot of purebred sheep that carry different um, color fibers um, in their wool, as well as there is a lot of commercials that when you start intermixing the breeds, um, they can really throw some beautiful speckles as well as some wool durations. We do have a couple sheep here today. Unfortunately, my kiddo just had his out, one of the black ones, but he just put it in the pen or else he'd probably be walking in the background right now. Um, but yes, they can be different colors, lots of browns, lots of blacks, uh, lots of like kind of tanned, um, peachy colors. So a mixture of different colors. And if you spray paint them, they can be very rainbow-like too. Awesome. Okay, Sloan from grade three has a question. How many babies can a sheep have in a year? Hey Sloan, that's a great question as well. So depending on the breeds, um, typically a ewe will have twins. So a single, uh, which is one lamb, or twins is two lambs, um, is pretty normal. Now when you go to Rideau Arcots and other breeds, a normal um, uh, lamb is four. So quads, triplets, uh, they've had five or six. So Rideaus are the type of animal, or type of sheep that you would have for prolificity and for like multiple births. So um, they have lots of babies where the ones we run, we generally are very happy with twins. Um, some of them will have triplets and we've had a couple sets of quads, but ideally twins or singles are the way to go. Awesome. Um, question from Henry Braun School. How often do you shear the sheep? That's a great question too. Thank you, Henry Braun, for coming in as well. So typically we will share at least once a year. Some uh, breeders and producers will, um, they'll do the bellies and then they'll crutch and do the bums too. So they do the bellies 
and the butt area, mostly because obviously when they lamb, uh, that's the area that they come out of. So you try to keep it clean um, and then you do the belly so that the baby can find the udders to get milk. Okay, great. Um, question from James in grade three. How many male sheep and female sheep do you have? Thank you for that question, James. So James, on our farm, uh, with the 60 ewes that we run, uh, for my Cheviots, I have 40 um, different North Country Cheviots on the farm, just about. So I run three rams to them. I try and break them up in like max 15 ewes to a ram. Um, so right now in our ram pen, we had a few more. We just sold a bunch. So we're down to about seven rams. So seven rams for 60 ewes. Now I know um, I had a friend here, um, Jason Struck. He'll be doing the shearing demonstration tomorrow morning at this time. So if you guys are able to, you'll want to come in there because it's a really cool demonstration. But on Jason's farm, um, him and his parents have 600 ewes and he is using 17 rams this year. So just kind of an idea of numbers. Awesome, awesome. Okay, I think most people know that sheep are used for wool, but are there different types of breeds of sheep not, not only used for wool? Yes, so there is um, a couple different things. So the sheep that I have on my farm, or on our farm, the Suffolk, the Hampshire, and the North Country Cheviots, they're, so the North Country Cheviots are identified as a medium wool breed, so they're not really fine, they're not necessarily a wool breed, characteristic at least, but they do have the ability to have more wool. Um, now the Suffolk is primarily for meat, so um, animals like the Texels, the Charlays, although they have wool on them, their primary focus because of their carcass, which is their body and their ability to develop muscle and meat, is to be processed, which is at the end of the day to uh, go into the grocery store as cuts and to feed our stomach. So, um, there's different, different breeds of animals that have different um, responsibilities or different avenues. So um, some other wool breeds, your Columbias, your Merinos, uh, your uh, Romneys. So they have really dense wool and just beautiful fibers and um, curl to it so that it's really beautiful to see their fleeces. But they, they can be butchered, but character characteristically they're not used for meat. Okay, awesome. Um, what do sheep eat? So depending on the operation and depending on where you're located throughout Canada and the United States, a lot of different farms have different grazing uh, projects. So we have pasture projects where the animals will be out on different um, kinds of grass all summer, um, as well as other people are feeding their animals. So we have wool, barley, oats, um, did I say wool? I meant barley, um, <laughs> rolled oats, uh, pellets. There's lots of different alfalfa pellets and protein pellets that people put in. There's a mixture of molasses and mer minerals that people will feed them. So depending on the time of year too, typically you'll move from like um, a hay and grain supplement into like your pasture, so foraged pasture. So it's just the transition of the season, obviously. So. So in comparison to billy goats, they are not. They have, um, when you start to shear and work with um, animals, they have lanolin in their wool. And so the lanolin has like a, a bit of a distinct taste, but it, I wouldn't say it stinks. Um, I have goats on our farm as well. And so they are very polar opposite ends of the spectrum um, in the stinky factor. <laughs> awesome. Okay, James in grade three has a question, how old can a sheep get? So James, depending on the breed as well, um, most, most ewes will get anywhere from uh, eight to 10 years. I think most of the time ours are seven to nine. Um, and it depends like their life cycle, it depends how the, how the season's going, how foraging's going, it depends a lot of things sometimes. Um, we can lose use with births and during pregnancy. So sometimes I would say on average seven to eight is the good average for a sheep, especially because they live outside in the elements. And so we know that elements take a toll on our body. Um, but mostly um, if there's no complications throughout, they can live anywhere from eight to 10 years. Okay, 
So on this cold winter blustery day, how does a sheep stay warm? So a big factor is their wool. So most of the time, the way the sheep's wool is, it'll keep the moisture on top and that's where the lanolin comes in. So when you part wool open, um, it'll be nice and wet or snow covered on top. And when you part it, as you get down, the lanolin will be a good little inch or two and it's, it's oily, so it tries to keep the moisture off their backs. Most of the time they'll be in sheds outside with a little bit of straw, but oftentimes too, depending, they'll just be cornered up in a fence and like keep in together and they take the heat of each other. Okay, and let's, let's all dream of a sunny, warm summer day. So the opposite, how does the sheep stay cool in the hot sunny day? So the summer is actually can be the toughest time on sheep. So especially at lambing time. So a lot of people will lamb out from January to like March. There are some of us that do summer um, lambing, but that brings different complications. So in the summer, uh, shearing them and letting them have a shorter coat is really important. Hydration is the other thing. And then a lot of like shade. Okay, awesome. Um, how often will a vet come out to your farm or, or any sheep farm? Well, and so that, that's a really good but complicated question. So all of us, depending on the different programs you have in your um, program with your animals, so some people run a program called Genovis, and so there's certain protocol to that, and vets come out and help or take blood. Um, they do scans, so a vet's probably coming out a little bit more. Other people just do your regular scheduled maintenance on the sheep um, and some blood work or like preg checking. Um, so on our farm, it can range. I, for us, we probably are le the least amount vet as possible unless something's sick because um, we do our own regular maintenance, but we've also had a vet come and visit and then we can co uh, consolidate with them. So a lot of times we're able to talk and just navigate without them actually making a farm visit. But I would say on average, most farms will see a vet one to three times a year. And if, if you have some more um, federal or provincial programs you're running, oftentimes you'll have them out more often. Okay, thank you. Okay, so how do sheep protect themselves from prey? So often sheep will try and flock together. Um, they're, they're naturally a flock animal, and so bigger numbers. The other thing that we will put into place is, so like on our farm, we run um, guardian dogs as well as llamas. And so those are our two versions of uh, protection. Some people run uh, donkeys, um, and then some people run other type of guardian dogs. So on our farm, we run Great Pyrenees, and we have three uh, Great Pyrenees females that we run with our ewes, and they are very protective over them. Pearl thinks she's a ewe. Um, she thinks she takes care of the lambs. Like if the mom goes off and another mom tries to come, she's very protective that she only allows the mom to come back to the lambs. She's quite funny that way. Um, and then our llamas, we run three of them. So um, we've had great fortune in the last couple years, but we definitely in the past have had many um, issues with prey. Um, or them being prey predators, I mean. And mostly our predators have been actual um, farm dogs or coyotes. Okay, so how do llamas protect sheep? So in our case, the one time we had a neighbor's dog, well, a couple of the neighbor's dogs come down and our llamas had backed the sheep into a corner and then they were standing out like a line of defense in front of the sheep. Uh, and then in front of the llamas were the dogs. So. It was like two lines of defense before they came in. Now, that was the time when they were in a corral. Out in a pasture, they'll try and wrangle their crew and make them come in close together, and then they try to walk wherever the uh, predator's coming in. Depending on the province you live in, we've heard of uh, grizzly bear attacks on sheep. There's been wolves, cougar attacks. Um, coyotes are quite normal, and then like neighbor's dogs, unfortunately, are uh, an can be a normal occurrence. Okay. Um, in Saskatchewan, how many sheep are there? Oh, that is a really good question. Tough question. There's a gentleman over there. So what I'm going to do, my son's standing here, I'm going to get Carson to go and ask Gord exactly how many sheep there are in Saskatchewan, and I will get that question back to you because uh, it has fluctuated. I know that. So.
I, I actually thought about that last night and I was like, mm, they might not ask that. <laughs> and here we are. That's a great That's question. A question. That's a awesome. great question. Okay, so why are sheep at Agribition? So sheep are here. So Canadian Western Agribition is the biggest livestock show in Canada. Um, it's one of the best livestock shows in North America. And so sheep are here because like the cattle, um, we have different breeds and we want to show off our genetics. A lot of it is promotion um, and of your own farms and getting out there. Um, there's a big international body here at Agribition. And so international means people come from all countries across the world. And when they come, they can't necessarily take the animals back because of different protocols and stipulations, but they can look at getting the, the genetics. So a lot of semen or embryos, um, and then they take those frozen and take them back and impl implement them. And that helps us continue to grow our genetics. So it's not all just one line. Okay, so do you know uh, what countries are visiting Agrivision? Um, so I know a couple, uh, Australia, Mongolia, USA, uh, Singapore, um, I think there's some people maybe from Denmark, uh, China, Japan, Great Britain, Mexico, which falls under USA, and then there's a couple, I believe according to the International Business Center, uh, there is 19 countries registered to be coming with delegates to come in and out of Agribition this year. Very much so. One second. About 60,000 breeding ewes on the dock. Okay. So, Gord tells me that there's about 60,000 breeding ewes on the dot in Saskatchewan at this time. Oh, wow. Wow, that's great. So, where do the... Um, so, like we talked about, sheep can be used for wool and sheep can be used for meat. So, where do they, where do they go? Where, where can you buy sheep products? So a lot of times um, when you're at your superstore or Sobeys, a lot of the lamb in that market is from New Zealand, um, and that's just the trade agreements. A lot of your uh, smaller uh, health stores that carry lamb, like Lakeshore, a lot of that lamb is local. So um, it's bought in and around from farmers around here and then brought in um, for uh, everyone's consumption, packaged in federal inspected arbitoires or plants or uh, butcher shops and then uh, brought into town but most of the Canadian market at this time we're trying to shift a little bit but the reality is with our Canadian population of sheep we cannot upkeep what the population in Canada consumes so uh, New Zealand has that primarily and uh, helps to offset that but we are slowly trying to uh, back that a little bit especially with our larger population of immigrants coming um, to Canada and taking residence here. A lot of them uh, from their home country, goat and lamb um, is a very normal food that they eat. So it's becoming more and more popular for sure. Okay, great. Question from grade three, four. How much does a sheep eat in a day? So usually um, throughout the day between your hay and your grains, they probably consume anywhere from, I would say three to four pounds of food and water is stagnant throughout the day. They're probably supposed to drink eight cups of water as well. Yeah, well, that's always a good thing to try and do. Awesome, okay, so we talked a bit about meat, where we can buy meat, where meat's processed. What about wool? Where can we buy sheep's wool? Okay, so a lot of the times the wool gets shorn and then it goes to, to be processed and then spinners and different companies buy it and make it into yarn. So if you've ever been at Michael's and there's those balls of yarn, of raw wool, that's wool that you can buy and actually crochet or knit into products. Um, depending, there's lots of different um, sheep skin insoles, hides. Uh, at hospitals, a lot of patients who will be bedridden will be on um, sheep skins, um, just be, for bed sores. Um, any of your wool, your merino wool sweaters, their socks, their scarves, their hats. Uh, now a big thing too is felting. So you can almost find wool products and sheep products in almost all the stores as you're going through um, a mall or a shopping center. Okay, 
So you had mentioned that there's more demand in Canada than what we produce in Canada for, for meat. So do you see that um, sheep will increase, sheep numbers will increase over the next while? So the hope, the hope is that they will. It's always kind of a tricky um, situation because the reality is you still need land. And right now, uh, with the growing population in society, a lot of our land is also needed uh, to produce fields and yields of your grains and your soys and your canolas so that we have those aspects in the, in the store as well. I think most producers that are in sheep right now are trying to increase, but it all, all depends on weather. Uh, the reality is with drought and like feed shortages, um, in order to sustain yourself and be resilient through the times that are difficult right now, oftentimes you have to decrease your flock numbers. So we hope that the reality is in decreasing that you're able to stick around and one day come back and have a larger flock because you made it through uh, the difficult times. Do most sheep farmers have other animals as well? So there is a lot of uh, multi-species farms. Here primarily um, we have quite a few producers who also have cattle, but then we also have a lot of producers here who are just sheep farmers. So. Um, it goes a bit way. I think there's been a lot of headway where there have been some um, cattle producers who have gotten some sheep. Sheep are really good for um, for weed and like weed issues. So in pastures, there's a lot of different uh, weeds and nuisances that they'll eat that a cow won't. Or goats are usually used too for like leafy spurge programs and projects. So um, they have a lot of different aspects to them that are similar to cows, obviously in a smaller duration, but then what they eat is a little bit different too. Okay, and why is that? Why can sheep eat more like plant material than a cow? Well, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily more plant materials than a cow because their body mass. It's just that sheep seem to, cows seem to like eat and keep walking and sheep you can keep more maintained into a smaller area. Uh, they don't quite, turn their noses up as much at thistles and the leafy spurge. And I don't know if it's, I, I don't know the science behind it, if it's like the taste buds in their mouth or um, how it amalgamates in their bellies. But for some reason, goats and sheep are used for a lot of weed control. Okay, so they're kind of less picky eaters than maybe cows. Yes. Okay, good. Well, we don't, we don't know anything about picky eaters out there, right, guys? Okay. Um, any other questions, please feel free to um, pop in the chat. Um, yeah, Courtney, is there anything else that you want to um, discuss or get across uh, today? I think the, um, the coolest things that I would put out to the kids is just like continuing to learn about where your food comes from. Um, although you might go to Superstore and see steak there, at some point there was, there was a farm that raised that. So that was born on the farm, it was fed up. Um, it might have went to a feedlot, it might have just went straight to market. And so it's always good to like support your farmers. Um, if you know a farmer, always be mindful and say thank you to them because right now there's a lot of tough times and it's not always easy um, to be resilient. But the beauty about farmers is that we're always focused on producing for others. And um, I think that's really wonderful. I think it's really cool when you break down a sheep um, maybe the teachers can do this. How many byproducts are out there that have sheep ingredients in them uh, would blow your mind or animal farm ingredients, you know, like your bubble gum, it has different components of an animal in it. I know that seems weird. Uh, your baseballs, the skin. So when you really break it down, your licorices, um, they carry, they're a byproduct of animals or the farm. And that's a really cool thing too. Awesome, awesome. Um, maybe one last uh, question before we wrap things up, unless we get more questions in the chat. Um, but how do, you, how do farmers make sure that their animals are cared for? So um, for some of you, uh, you have teachers and maybe the teachers have kids. So, and I'm sure some of you have siblings or younger siblings and you've seen it where mom had a baby and the baby comes home and mom has to care and nurture for that baby. So. The farmers are very much like the parents of the animals because unlike kids, uh, the animals don't grow up to care for themselves. So they're very dependent on us for feeding and watering them, for ensuring that their feet are maintained, right? Because they're really important when they're standing on them, that their fur and wool is maintained depending on um, 
depending on the breed or the livestock, um, that they have the proper pastures, that they have the proper penning and uh, health management. So those are two things. Now, as I said that, I said hare and I completely forgot because I didn't know if we had them here last year. But another breed that we uh, have here today, it's a hare sheep and it's called the Katahdin. So in, in sheep, we vary between wool and hare. So, and the Katahdin is also another breed of sheep that's used primarily for meat. Okay, we do have a couple of questions. So from grade three, four, what type of sicknesses are common in sheep? Oh, that's a good one too. So um, depending on the on the time of year, but some of them are scours, which is um, formulated kind of like diarrhea in, in kids. And, and diarrhea kind of starts kind of with like a flu in your tummy and then it's processed. Um, we have uh, pneumonia, um, your, your coughs. We can have animals that have sugar deficiencies, kind of like a diabetic. Uh, hypoglycemic. Um, there can be a lot of different issues that arise around having babies um, and just the matter of fluid or blood loss um, where mom's sugar levels are. And then there's in the summer months we also have to worry about fly strikes. So those pesty black flies sometimes land on our animals and they bite away at them um, and sometimes they'll just bite away but other times they lay eggs and then their eggs um, reach out into maggots and then you have an I issue where you have to deal with maggots and that's in the summer months that's one of the biggest ones that and scours. Okay okay and I think probably through like making sure the farmers are, are watching and making sure and calling a vet. A lot of that is management right so that, that goes back to the care when you're saying how we do it a lot of it is having a presence so you do your chores but you're also while you're doing your chores you're looking at your flock or your herd if we're talking about cattle um, you can see if there's pink eye because they have that they have ringworm so there's a few things that actually come from from animals but also like that that humans can get too we can get ringworm we can get pink eye uh, there's different flus right there's different colds and coughs they can get that um, they equally it's not called hay fever but kind of like a hay fever so um, they can have issues depending on the dust or the the different bacteria in bales that you feed them they can get really sick from that so there's a lot of different things that as a livestock producer you have to really watch um, your management of how you're taking care herd management uh, flock management and then the health so upkeeping that and staying on it it's always good if you see sometimes their ears will start to droop you'll notice they're not eating as much so being able to go out there multiple times during the day and every day, you, you start to know your animals. Okay, thank you for that. Um, another question from grade three, four, do you name your sheep? <laughs> yes, um, not all of them get named. The ones that are in the butcher pen, we try not to name uh, for obviously obvious reasons, uh, but they do get named sometimes. Um, and then most of the time when we're showing my, especially my kiddos have them and always my sires and my uh, breeding dams will usually have names. Okay, and maybe do you want to explain what a sire and a, is it? Okay, so uh, the terminology, a baby sheep is called a lamb, um, a female sheep, so you'll have lambs, and then if it's a female, it's a ewe lamb, if it's a boy, it's a ram lamb, um, and then we have yearly ewes, which is their one year old, and then after a yearly ewe, they're matures. Okay, so up until one, 12 months, they are known as lambs. Once they hit the one year mark, 12 months, they're yearling. Once they hit two years, which is 24 months, they're matures. And that goes for ewes and rams. Now the dam is the mom and the sire is the dad. So uh, those are the terminology. In a purebred, you'll have a paper with kind of like the breakdown of breeding. And so on the dam side, you'll get also the grandparents, the dams and the sires and the mom. Um, and then the, the, the sire side, you get that too. So you can see the whole genetic lineage, the ancestry. Yeah, that's amazing. You love to remember too. Okay, so we're just uh, about out of time here. So thank you so much, Courtney, for talking to us about sheep production and why it's so important in Saskatchewan and important at Agribition. Um, we really encourage everybody to check out all of the material on our, our digital platform for Agribition, and we really hope that you can attend in person too. 
So thank you so much. Wonderful. And honestly, if you have time, I know there's another Q&A at 1.30 today, as well as tomorrow at 9.30 and 1.30. Tomorrow morning is shearing. So um, teachers, if you have a moment, uh, there's different, different animals presented at both afternoons. And tomorrow morning, we'll be shearing with uh, some com a combination of instruction as well as different details of shearing. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, classrooms, and enjoy your day.